know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am in charge of your life. I am in charge of all situations in your life. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, you look at me and you say, but Lord, some are unpleasant. Yet I am in charge, says the Lord your God. And I want you to be consciously aware because out of nothing I can do something. I can perform all sorts of miracles. It is I that have sent strong delusion over my people. I sent it, says the Lord your God, not man, but I. It is I that lead armies out into battle. Yea, and you say within yourself, why? Because I am God. Allow me to be God and that I can work through your life. I can do the things that I want to do. And there are many things that I want to do in your life to bring you to a place of real victory. What I mean by real victory is knowing that you're not a conqueror, you're more than a conqueror. I know the authority that I have given unto you to walk that walk with me in my presence, says the Lord your God. Focus on me. Focus on the cross. Focus, and let your focus be there, and you'll see the power that there is in the Lamb of God this night, says the Lord your God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, you're a great God again and again. We just worship you. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the presence. I thank you, Lord, for the way you speak through your spirit to your people. Father, may we give ear to hear what the spirit has said. Lord, where your word has said, despise not prophecy. Father, may we receive the prophetic and receive the words that you have spoken this night to your people. Let your word challenge us, Father. Let your word encourage, word encourage us. And Father, may we be made mighty and strong this night. Fully equipped, Lord and God, to go and fight the battles being led by the, our mighty warrior. As you lead us, Lord and God, you're going to lead us in not only into battle, but into victory. We claim that victory in Jesus' name. Praise God with us. Despise not the day of small things. See, takes an Irishman to understand true humor. <laughs> no, uh, I was up in uh, Arnhem Land. We'd been in Darwin and uh, with their tent and preaching the gospel there, and uh, they asked me to go into Arnhem Land. And uh, so I went to Arnhem Land there, and we were at a place called Nuku. And uh, it, it was just really a sort of half a house sort of thing. And it was packed. There must have been about 20 a small house in there. And so anyway, I preached the gospel and then began to pray for the sick. And I noticed there was a, there was a older gentleman, Aboriginal brother, sitting in a kitchen chair, on a kitchen chair. So, you know, I just walked over to him and said, what's the matter with you? We're all blood on my leg, leg, leg. I said, well, Jesus name me. Now, you, you that know me know that I say, release your faith. Learn to release your faith. You're not going to get healed if you don't release faith. The best way to release your faith is start doing what you couldn't do before. So I said to him, get up and walk around the room. So he got up and walked around the room. The place went crazy. And I'm thinking, boy, these guys are excitable. <laughs> the local missionary said to me, no, you don't understand. He hasn't walked for 10 years. And he said he was riding a, a bull in a rodeo and it fell on him. You know, crushed it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I thought, well, there's another lesson for you, Dave. Easy to believe God for a miracle when you don't know how bad it is. <laughs> Praise God. I want to continue to go on uh, 
the benefits. I've been teaching on the benefits and always leading it into a healing uh, ministry. And so what I want to preach on today is more benefits. But I want to say this. It's always concerned me uh, about healing, you know, and uh, other things too, but particularly about healing because I worked as a traveling evangelist, went all over the world and preached the gospel and, and uh, it used to amaze me. I, I, was, I was more amazed when people didn't get healed than when they did and, and I realized after a while that was God at work in my life trying to teach me stuff. And uh, I realized that it was a faith problem and I realized the word of God said because he's a covenant keeping God say covenant keeping God now, now where have you heard that before huh? covenant keep he keeps his word and his word says by his stripes you are healed it talks about healing over and over and it never says I may heal you I could heal you it says I will heal you All right. it's true and I got to thinking one day I was up in uh, I was in Canada and uh, uh, preaching to uh, uh, on, a, on a, a reservation up there and it was a mixture of um, you would call them Sioux uh, Lakotas and Cree and Chippewas right I mean there's a miracle right there you get three different tribes getting together in peace that's a miracle <laughs> but, but anyway I was preaching away, and an old lady come up, uh, and she was obviously in a great deal of pain, could hardly walk. But they're just as poor as poor can be. And she had two broomsticks. She'd hacked off of brooms, old brooms, and she was using them for crutches. Mm -hmm. huh? And she, she started probably first, but she was one of the last to actually get there, We're up to the healing line. And there were quite a few people got healed. And she'd watch, you know, and grin and start. Huh? I thought, this is going to be interesting. She got up to me. You know what she did? <laughs> she gave me the two broomstick handles, said, thank you, and walked away. <laughs> and I thought, now that's faith. Yeah, that's faith. Building. All right, praise God. She believed. <laughs> huh? She couldn't read or write, I found out later, but she believed, you know. And uh, she said later, ah. I don't know, she said to a friend oh, who told me, there's a white man that keeps his word. I said, oh, no, no, no. Now, my dad was a native, just like you, you know. So she said, oh, it must have been the native half that was talking. Still had a problem with people. But God healed her. And I started to think, why does God heal people? And yet we see so many miss out when he has promised he would do it. And it's not a problem. Now let me tell you something. Are you smart? Oh, come on, boy. That's it. You can always trust an Irishman. When you need him to yell. <laughs> well, you said it. <laughs> but it's true. Now, let's see if you can pass the Randall Smart Test. All right, and I'm just warming up here. All right, number one, if you put some leftovers in your microwave oven and come back in five minutes and it's just as cold as it was when you put it in and it's not cooked up at all, obviously the switch wasn't flicked. Now, you know, I may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, as they say in Australia. But I know when the microwave oven's off, it's the first thing I look, ah, oh, it's off. Click, turn it on, get your desire. And I realize that many, many Christians, they love God, they believe in healing, they believe God meets their needs and everything, but it doesn't happen for them. And why is that? Why? 
Because it's God's desire that you should be healed. Now just pardon the testimony for a minute. <coughs> I was born with a thing called AIS. Ah, Native Americans get it when their mothers carry them or th their mothers are pregnant with them in winter. And uh, Pastor Carl knows my mama. And uh, she was pregnant in winter in the poorest reservation in America. And she carried me and said, uh, uh, Native kids are born with this thing that's often called AIS, uh, American Indian Syndrome. Uh, and what happens is, put your high hand up and say, I will not laugh. Put your right hand up and promise me you won't laugh at me. Thank you. That'll do. <laughs> he said, you're born short. You have no, as they say in Australia, bum. Huh? And you are born, remember you promised you wouldn't laugh, backward. You're mentally backward. And I was born like that. And uh, because mom didn't have enough to eat and she prayed and asked God because she became a Christian by herself remembering a sermon that she heard preached in in uh, Newcastle, I oh know, Maitland, Australia, because she was an Australian. She married my dad, soldier. And uh, she was going to America, the rich, great, free country. She didn't know she, she, didn't know she was going to the poorest reservation in America. She didn't even know my dad was native. But she found out. And there was no, hardly no food for him. The government again had made all kinds of promise because they got a million acres off their tribe. And the idea was that they would supply so much cattle, so many hogs, so many chickens through the winter because we had no way of getting through the winter otherwise. But she cried out to God and God told her, and it sounds like a funny thing, uh, to eat uh, powdered starch. That's what she did and it kept her alive. Uh, but when I was born, I just lay there. I put a bottle in my mouth and just fall out, you know. My old granny used to hold me there for hours and shake the bottle. And finally, you know, <coughs> Mama got real sick and everything. And some people from the local church come and took us boys in. And they were looking at me and they took me over to a, a tent meeting. Oh. We lived in Texas and uh, to a tent meeting and uh, evangelist prayed for me. Huh? Now, I'm not six foot. I know you find that hard to believe. Huh? But I'll tell you what. Suddenly, I was alive. You understand? What I, mean? I was no longer in that position. Huh? And as my brother Johnny would often say, Pity God did that. Should have left well enough alone. <laughs> and so I'm able, and because of the healing of God, and it's not quite two years old and still just laying there. Right. But He healed me mentally and healed most of the problems in my body. But it didn't grow, and that's because everybody knows that good things come in small packages. Glad to see no one wants to argue with me. <laughs> Praise God. Go to Psalm 103, verse 1. This is our text we've been using week after week after week after week <clears throat> in coming and praying for the six things and wonderful healings. It says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul. You all there? Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his... Benefits. Yell it out. Benefits. benefits. There are benefits in Christianity. The trouble is a lot of Christians never figure it out. 
And I'm kind of picking up where Pastor John, he was preaching on the deposit. And benefits are part of the deposit in the Holy Spirit that you receive when you're saved. And a lot of people, you know, <laughs> they're going to go and see King Jesus and they have, you know, passed on and gone into glory. And they got all their benefits still with them. They never used one. A lot didn't know about it and others didn't understand how it worked. But listen to me. There are benefits to being a Christian. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless His holy name. Speaking of worship, and it's in worship and truth that you start to come into uh, the, the benefits of the living God. Now back home, uh, I've told you this before, but it's true. I need to say it again. Uh, you say... Uh, throw a wobbly you know when people go, 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 go mate chuck a wobbly that's it oh, I was close yeah but we don't say that we say they're throwing a fit and that's true in Texas they're throwing a fit when they act like that right and and you often hear a mom or dad say and kids in in in, in uh, stores Shops, shop centers. They're all the same. Doesn't matter where you go, they act the same. <laughs> huh? Of course, I, I never liked that. We didn't. We lived nowhere near a store, that's why. <laughs> and what they're doing is they're throwing a fit. Now, beloved, listen to me. You can throw a fit or you can have a benefit, but you can't have both. And some people, they get kind of old. Uh, mad at the Lord and mad at Christianity and mad at this because they didn't get what they want. But it's like the microwave. Don't blame the microwave. The power switch is turned off. And God didn't turn it off. So we need to understand that these benefits are there so that you can override the things that would stop you from receiving the blessings of God. And that includes healing, it includes uh, uh, peace and joy. In fact, uh, what is Christianity? It is righteousness, peace, and joy. Sounds like some of you actually believe that. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. You're not supposed to be walking around like a sad sack. What's wrong, brother? Oh, nothing. Ask me again. When they dump all this stuff on you. Uh -huh. Listen to me. Jesus died and rose from the dead that you had righteousness, peace, and joy. Say righteousness. righteousness. First thing. Righteousness. If righteousness is evident in your life, peace and joy will automatically follow. You can always tell someone that's moving in real solid righteousness. You know what? They're happy little Vegemites. Or what I'm going to teach them when I get back home. See, happy little <coughs> peanut butters. <laughs> Psalm 103 verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Father, we come before you and we thank you that your word is truth. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit who is our great teacher. And we, by an act of faith and by choice, open our hearts and minds to receive revelation knowledge tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And so that's our text that we've been using over the weeks. Let me just tell this little story, true story, had to do with... Uh, First World War. And the First World War had ended, and uh, Germany had uh, lost that war. But while that war was raging, Germany was fighting with England and France and Australia and, you know, such. And there was a great French general, considered one of the greatest generals of his day. And he decided to go down and to check out the, the troops that were in the trenches. You know, generals do that. He's kind of trying to lift their morale. 
And anyway, he was in the trench there talking to a young sergeant, and a German hand grenade landed at his feet. And it was active. That man, that general, just as good as dead. And that young sergeant that he was talking to fell on the grenade because he realized they had to have that general if they wanted to win the war. And of course it exploded. The result was, yeah, I've got to work from memory here, he blew out his left eye, took out his left ear, burned his bottom part of his face, blew off both arms, left arm at the elbow, right arm at the shoulder, uh, radically, terribly uh, damaged his stomach, so that from, uh, his, he did recover, but he could only eat arrowroot biscuits. He couldn't eat anything, because it wouldn't digest properly. And uh, leg gone, two arms gone, eye gone, ear gone. And they thought he'll die, but he didn't die. He became the most decorated French soldier uh, in the First World from the First World War. Very, very famous man in France. And the general didn't get a lick. Nothing happened to him because that young man fell on it. Uh -huh. Not expecting to live through it, but he did. Now, that young sergeant had a brother. He was actually a twin. And his brother was one of the worst criminals in France, particularly during that world war, and started a black market gang. And in the end, he stole secrets somehow, got somebody that was in the know and stole secrets from the French army and sold them to the Germans. Of course, after the war, it caught up with him. And the French people had one thought in mind. They were going to chop his head off. Let him dance with Miss Guillotine. Huh? So he was being tried, found guilty, and they were just about to sentence him. When in came this war hero. Everybody knew him. And he came in, his sleeves rolled up, no arms, wooden leg, ear gone, blind him. And he held those stumpy arms up to the judge. He said, he's my brother, Lord. Don't, uh, he's my brother, judge. Don't kill him. There were actually three judges. They were so moved because of what this man had done. They gave the brother to the good brother. Said, he's your responsible now. We're going to let him free. See, there was a benefit there for the bad brother because of the work of what the good brother had done. That's a true story. Should have died. Should have had his head chopped off. The, uh, the French sergeant, the war hero, pleaded for immunity for his bad brother. So what I want to share tonight on the benefit of immunity. Would you go in your Bibles with me to Romans 4, verse 4? Now Romans 4, verse 4 through 7 is a quote from Psalms 32, 2. So not only is it found in the New Testament, it is a prophecy of what God had intended to do years and years and years before Jesus Christ came. Romans 4, verse 4, 4 through 7 says this, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, say justifies the ungodly. Justifies. Say justifies the ungodly. See, when I first used to read that, I thought he was talking about, you know, how Jesus died for our sins, and that his blood was shed for us, and, and, but he, he's not talking about that at all. He's talking about the next step. 
the next step that many Christians don't realize, and it's justification, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. That's true. His blood flowed. We are forgiven our sins. So, amen. amen. Wonderful. But then we got a problem. we got to live as Christians from here until we get to heaven. And I'd like to tell you how old baby baby has never sinned as a Christian. But that would just be one more sin, wouldn't it? Make me a liar. Don't laugh at me, you all liars yourselves. Right? Because there is a struggle in the life of men and women, when, you know, especially when they get saved, they want to live for Christ. They want to be holy. Right? <laughs> I, I said to my younger brother, and I get saved, I don't understand it. I got saved and I got worse. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know? My behavior got worse rather than better. I think I've told you before that I used to go to this prayer meeting with all these young people. I was young then. All these, oh, I was 21. All these young people used to go and they'd be all, oh, God, God, raise me up. Put me in the healing ministry, Lord. Make me a pastor, Lord. Make me a teacher. And I'm in the corner going, God, get me through the day without stealing something. Because I'd lived that life for so long. And didn't always work for me. Huh? Is that right? Can I be honest? See, you thought I was perfect, but I got bad. I was a perfect idiot. You don't understand the struggle. The struggle. The enemy comes against you and starts to try and bring you down and discourage you because he wants you to give up. Say amen. amen. See, verse 5, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, say justifies the ungodly. Turn to your neighbor and say, God justifies you. Amen. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. See, first people read that and they think they're talking about, you know, that we're forgiven when we're first saved, and we are, and thank God we are. But it's not what he was talking about. He was talking about your journey as a Christian and your behavior as a Christian from here to heaven. Because what? Because God wants you righteous. Now, when I was first saved, we used to get them long, skinny, <coughs> ugly <laughs> preachers, and they'd come and they'd start telling you, it was bad. I'd be sitting there. You gotta understand. I was saved out of a gang situation. I'd have been in. I, I went. <laughs> see, see, when we were kids, the government come along, took us off our parents, and put us in residential school. Well, I didn't want to get in residential, so I kept running away. So then they put me in the kiddies jail. And they said you won't get out of there. Three days later, Davey was gone. So I had real plans to get out, but I never made a plan on what to do after I was out. And I was three states from where I lived. So in the end, I ended up in one of the worst youth correction centers in the whole country. And it soured me and made me learn to hate. I knew it was only one reason, because we were mixed race. <laughs> it was so funny. The Americans didn't want us. And the Cherokees didn't want us. We were kind of stuck in no man's land in the middle. But in the end, I came out of there full of hatred and bitterness, ended up in the gang, just, just lived foolishly. Listen to me. And then I finally got saved. Hallelujah. And boy, when I got saved, I went down to that altar and something happened. It was real. I remember it to this day, boy. I felt like a bottle of soda pop. And everything was fizzing up and oh, It was, well, see? The next thing, a few years later, I'm in Australia and bumps into Pastor Colin. We used to go around preaching. God gave us a tent and we tented. We had big time. Praise God. 
But listen to me, beloved. I still was battling things in my flesh that I knew were not right before God. And what I didn't realize at the time, the long-term effect of compromising your walk when you're first saved, when you're saved. You understand that? I didn't realize the damage that it was doing. Most Christians do. So this is what I want you to understand today. Remember I said about them preachers that come, the ugly ones? Uh-huh. I don't mean how they looked, it was how they preached and acted. They stand at the front of the church, boy, and they draw back and that long finger had come out. <laughs> you need to repent. You've been sinful this week. And I'd go, he knows. Huh? I used to get saved every Sunday night. Because I was scared of going to hell. And there's two things you need to know. One, they had no idea what they were talking about. And they were just, you know, Jesus brought me to life and they were scaring me to death. But Jesus did a miracle for me. It's all right, sweetie, just calm down. Bigger than me anyway. Praise God. That's all right, they're just a little kid. Used to see what I used to do in church. It's gone. My brother and I snuck into the ladies' laboratory <laughs> while the preacher was preaching. Got bored, see? What did you do there? <laughs> Emptied all the paper. <laughs> well, there was some praying going on then. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> see, things happen that you get saved and you think, oh, "Praise God." Hallelujah. I went out the front, you know, and I fizzed and popped and, and the Holy Spirit was there, you know. And I knew I was saved. No one had to tell me I was saved. <laughs> I'm a changed man. I went and told him, I'm a changed man. Right up until I stole my brother's brand new tape recorder. Uh, that only took me a week. Saved a week and stole his... Uh, now, I don't know where he stole it from, but anyway. Uh, so problems were there in my life. And I want to tell you, if you're honest with yourself, that particularly as you start this walk with God, there will be problems in your life because the enemy will show up and make sure they're there. Boy, I tell you, I got saved and I was shouting happy with a new tape recorder. <laughs> there was a girl in our town. She is the prettiest thing. I chased her uphill and down dale before I was saved. She wanted anything to do with me. I, and I didn't blame her. After I got saved, <laughs> she thought I was Elvis's brother. It's probably because I told her that. But <laughs> No, no, you understand? And uh, uh, But she was kind of real generous, so to speak, if you get my drift. And so what did I do? Messed up. So listen to me, beloved. This is not just a confession sermon. We're going somewhere with this. Verse 8 said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Now let me see. What I got in my pocket? I'm getting dry. I need somebody to volunteer to go to the back there and get me a glass of preacher's petrol. Water. I'll pay them five bucks if they do it, one of the kids. Which one of your kids wants to do? Get five bucks. I'll give you five bucks for it. It'll be yours to keep. Come on, sweetie. Never pass up an opportunity. That's the American in me talking. Come on now, come on now, come on now. Who, who wants it? Oh, come on. 
But I did this at, the Aboriginal, at an Aboriginal meeting and I only got killed in the stampede. Huh? Five bucks. That's not bad to, to give a preacher a glass of water. Huh? So what are they doing? They're earning by doing a job. I have promised them five dollars if they do that job and get the water from there to here. <laughs> yep. They're out of water. <laughs> you know, I have good nights and there's sometimes, not so good, but anyway, they'll get back here directly because, uh, because they better hurry up. I'm thirsty. Here he comes. Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, come on. You got three of you learning five bucks. I don't know how you're going to split it, but mom will figure it out. Now you've got to bring it up to me. You did a good job, thank you. Whose money is that? Whose money is it? Whose money is it? It's his. It's his. I can't take it back now. He earned that. He got me some water. At least I hope this is water. <laughs> if I get you a cup of tea, will you give me 20? If you give me tea, if you give me tea, you'll have to give me 20. <laughs> right. You understand that? Now, now, let me show you the difference between this and, and what the Bible's actually saying there. Say, I got another $5 here. Now, where's that girl that was with that boy? Was there a couple of them or just one of them? There she is. Come and get your five bucks, darling. This is not for doing... This is a gift. You didn't do anything for it. It's yours. I gave it to you. All right? You understand the difference now? That money is hers. I can't take it off you. And they'll think I'm the greatest preacher that ever hit Australia. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Bought it for five bucks. <laughs> Praise God. Listen to me, beloved. It's important. The first one earned their five bucks. It's their five bucks. Can't take it back. They earned it. But the second one was I decided to bless them with five bucks. And they got it for nothing. But it's just as much theirs as if they had done a job. It's theirs. I can't take it back now. Huh? Because it's theirs. Huh? One is earned, the other is imputed. You understand the word imputed now? It's imputed to them. So that's their, that's their blessing right there. And that's going to help you understand something as we get into this. I bought the water, it cost me five bucks. The five dollars was payment for his work. That five dollars belonged to him. He earned it. True? True. But the one I gave to the little... What's her name again? Who? Jasmine. Did you say Jasmine? Well, I'll come to Australia and find a girl with a southern Texas name. Jasmine. Well, be golly, there's a Jasmine here. And so Jasmine gets five bucks, but she didn't earn it. That was a gift. But she earns that five bucks as much as the one who earned it. I can't demand it back. It's hers for as long as she wants it. And she can use it for anything she wants with mom's blessing. My generosity, generosity gave her her benefit. It was imputed to her from me to him. Now many Christians don't understand that when the Bible says imputed, have no idea what it's talking about. And uh, here we are Christians sitting out on our walk and we're trapped in a foul prison of mental guilt. Come on now. And then you get preachers come along, point their long bony fingers at you and tell you you're the worst hypocrite sinner that ever come along. So you run up and get saved again. 
or leave the church in disgust feel such a failure never come back again that's foolishness because the Bible does not teach that yet there's lots of preachers that will teach it and preach it and here we need to understand uh, that the worst prison you can ever find yourself in is the prison of your own mind when you need to receive a miracle from God suddenly they can see their sins and they feel that they don't deserve it. Now, it's not about thinking. This is where a lot of people, well, you know, just don't think it. No, no, it's a feeling deep within you that interrupts your ability to receive from God. You know that? A lot of people, it, it's been going on for so long, they don't even notice the feeling anymore. But Christians battle all kinds of things as they walk from here to heaven. And some of them are taught and believe that they're never going to get to heaven because they're such terrible failures. Now listen, I'm not saying that there aren't some in the church that the enemy is set there to cause problems. We call them hypocrites. Hypocrite means play actor. And there's churches where... They, uh, <laughs> you know, I like to witness and tell people about the Lord and many many times particularly in Australia people say to me I don't go to church there's too many hypocrites there it's true have you ever heard that yep. yeah. you know what I say oh it's alright we'll move over and make room for another one <laughs> because they just heard that very few bump into real hypocrites anymore because it's not socially acceptable to go to church. When it was socially acceptable, you sort of had to go to church. Boy, the place packed out with hypocrites. You know. But now, you find maybe weak Christians, but not necessarily hypocrites. They are there, but few and far between. So I'm not talking or saying that you are hypocrites, but I'm saying that when you get saved and you begin your walk, suddenly things begin to challenge that walk. Come on now. Yeah. Yeah. Say amen. Or is it just me? Huh? I'll to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. So I used to so, belong to this gang. So we stole stuff and we robbed and we because I hated everybody. Right? And you know what's funny thing? They all hated me. Could never figure that out. Because I kept stealing everything they had. But one day I decided I can't keep stealing. I made a decision to overcome the stealing problem. Right? Now you've got to understand the little town where I lived, no one would give me a job. Because my brothers and I were fame, or infamous is the right word. When you gave us a job, we took the till home. We loved our work so much, we didn't bring it back. You understand? And one night I was walking home from a prayer meeting. I was as broke as, as, uh, I was as, broke as could be. Didn't have, didn't have a dime, one thing, nothing. I was walking back. It's about three quarters of an hour walk from... Uh, where we were having the prayer meeting at the church to where I live. I was walking along and the church was on one side of town. You had to walk through the town up over the railroad bridge and to get to where I lived. So I'm walking through town. Now listen, I'm flat broke. I had just sworn off stealing. Walk past the local jeweler shop and you will never believe that door was open. And I thought straight away, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> this will meet my need. I promise I'll pay it back in the installment lie plan. You know, they call it laying away. It was, I was lying away. Huh? And then I thought, wait a minute. I prayed a prayer. Am I going to honor my prayer? Can't be a hypocrite. So... What I did, I stood there a while, there's the doors open, jewels, everything's in there. <laughs> so I, I went over and I asked the Lord to forgive me, but I knew how to jiggle the telephone. Remember the old 
right? You get a, what you guys call a paddle pop stick. You put it in there and get click. <laughs> Free call. <laughs> Amazing how you know that. <laughs> so, and I called the police <laughs> with a crooked call. Said, you all need to get down here. The jeweler's shops must have been broken into. The door's wide open. He, and they said, is there anybody in there? I said, no. I said, would you stand in front of the, thing, the, the door till we get there? Sure, I don't mind. What's your name? And I told him there was this long silence. <laughs> And they must have thought I could see it and think, it must be two of them in town. So I stood there, singing, bringing in the sheaves, we shall overcome, oh how I love Jesus. And any other song I can think of so I keep my mind off what was in that store. Huh? And anyway, they turned up and looked at me. And I tell you right now, the old sergeant got out, the sheriff got out, and he went, It is you. Always was. Turn your pockets out. <laughs> First thing they said, I said, but I'm guard. You told me to go. Turn your pockets out. But I had no jewelry on me, see? Mel Sarge said to me, someone told me you got religion. Huh? Now I believe them. We thought you were doing something to steal the offering. I don't know why they thought that, just because me and my brother had done it before. <laughs> you understand? And I realized that I had passed the test. Yes. And I thought, I know how this works. The sheriff's going to give me a lift home because it started to rain. No. I walked home soaking wet, but I was a happy little Vegemite. Didn't know that term then, but that's what I was. Because I had conquered a problem. Listen to me, there'll be times that you will conquer problems, praise God. But lots of times you won't. All right, that, that good enough for you? Lots of times you won't. Let me get back to this uh, passage of Scripture. Now we're doing this in relation to how to receive healing, but how to receive anything from God. And... Uh, when they need to receive a miracle from God, suddenly they can see their sin or their compromise and feel that they do not deserve to receive from the Lord. They focus on their failure instead of the promises of God. They lock themselves out of the benefits of God. A big ball and chain is locked tightly around their faith dragging them down to their failure. And I want to tell you something, beloved. In a minute, you're going to understand this scripture that we've been sharing. It is vitally important that you understand the Word of God. Good scripture learning is this. Information, interpretation, application. Read it, understand it, do it. You got it? Apply it. And here, there's so many, beloved, they, they want to receive. They want their miracle of healing. They want their miracle of finance. They want their miracle for their kids. They want this. Th it just doesn't seem to happen. Why? What's going on? That beyond their thought realm, in the realm of the emotional feelings, a deep guilt is bubbling away and that often bubbles up when they're believing God the most. Do you understand that? And it gets down to deserve. Now let me tell you a great truth. I want you to look at me, smile at me, open both ears. Jesus said if you have ears, let him hear. Hear this. Did you hear it? So I didn't say anything. I did that for effect. And it's this, beloved. That if you can just get beyond this realm 
And it's a psychological thing because often you will not think about it so much. You may not even feel it, but it's there bubbling away. You failed. You failed. You're a failure. There's different ways of failing. You know, some people fail one way, some people fail the other. Then they get up in church and judge each other. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a better Christian than he is. He smokes cigarettes. I only smoke cigars. Huh? And they zero in on other Christians' failures and make a judgment. Don't do that. You know why? Because you're not in the right place to make the judgment. We have one judge. Listen to me. As you travel this way, you need to be in a place where you are free to receive God's benefits. Say amen. amen. Say, I need to be free. Well, there's four of us need to be free. Say, I need to be free. I need to deal with this thing. It's working against me psychologically. It's working against me. It's trying to keep me from receiving what God wants to give me, His benefits. Because deep, deep, deep down, I don't deserve it. Because you started out thinking that once you were saved, you had to live as holy as possible. And there's nothing wrong with having that desire. That's a good thing to desire. And as much as possible, live that way. But I don't care who you are. You're going to have a failure or two. Isn't that good to tell you? Boy, that's positive thinking. I'd get kicked out of some churches for saying that. But it's true. Sooner or later, you're going to have a failure. And there's all kinds of different failures. What you fail at, somebody else mightn't. But they'll often judge you for doing your failure while they have their own failures to worry about. See, the Bible says clearly, Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. Say free. Free means totally free. He doesn't say he came to set them partly free or a little bit free. Are ninety percent free. He came to set them free. Don't sit there rehashing your old failures in your Christian war. Now it may not be while the meeting's on. You may just have a different time having a coffee, and all of a sudden, you remember what you did. And what you'll do is one John one nine. Oh Father, forgive me, in Jesus name. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just. Forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from... And you prayed that a hundred times. Didn't you believe that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins? Now remember, this is part of a, 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 a series of sermons. So I want to just say this again. Now listen. He was wounded, He died, that the old man's sins were taken away. But it goes on and says he rose for their justification. Say amen. amen. Now that's important. Most Christians miss it. Right there. He rose from the dead so that you can become the righteousness of God in Christ by being deemed so. You didn't earn it. The harder you try to earn it, the more you're going to mess up. Ask me how I know. How do you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. Because yeah. I tried it. All right. And I failed almost as much as St. John back there. No, 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 no. But you understand what I'm saying? Every one of us had the same problem. It's this walk from here to heaven and messing it up. And no. And some Christians get so discouraged. They ain't going to church no more. I'm such a hypocrite. That's exactly what Satan's trying to get to. And what you understand is that you don't understand the second promise of the gospel. See? Now the gospel is a three 
fourfolded covenant. Number one, he died to wash away the sins of the old man. <coughs> Excuse me, you understand? Secondly, he rose to take care of the sins that happen as you walk from here to heaven. Say amen. Well, oh boy, excuse me, I'm getting happy. Can't help myself. You understand? Righteousness, peace, and joy. What's the first word? Righteousness. Don't you think, but see, how many of you know God is not stupid? I look at some saints and I think, well, no, no, no. God's not stupid. Right? Jesus isn't an idiot. They didn't design a, a, a way of walking with the Father and with the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit and he grabs them. I was going to grab the Irishman but he might uh, grab me back. He grabs hold of them and says, now don't you mess up the little one. I'll see you in heaven if you're a good boy. See Grace. Turn around and say, that's grace. That's grace. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you, you understand? It doesn't say that. Although it does encourage us and admonish us to live as holy as we can. Amen. So we're not saying uh, this is an easy way and you just go ahead and sin, live like the devil. It's not freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin. From the guilt that's there. The guilt is the problem. And it eats at you and eats at you deep down and it's going on whether you feel it or think it it's still happening and it's working to do one thing stop you receiving the promises of God don't sit there rehashing old failures lies and deception robbing stealing sexual affairs moral failures slander gossip tail bearing you're not tail bearing this, don't you? Yep. Uh, see, a lot of people, I'm not a gossip, no, but they're tail bearers. The gossip tells them something and they run it all over town telling everybody else. They're bearing the tail. Uh, tail bearers. Some people are abusing their kids terribly. <clears throat> Some get into revenge and demand payback. Some have leanings towards hypocrisy. You know, they're at home watching the porno. And not just the men. And then they sit in church. Oh, how I love you. You understand? They're, they're really moving into hypocrisy when they do that. Oh, oh Christians wouldn't wouldn't be into porn oh yeah ask any pastor who does counseling people struggle with it hypocrisy swearing or cussing as we say in America what a lot of people in Australia don't realize you know and I, it's kind of you come to a new country you, re, you realize things listen to me we call it cussing that's just a Texas way of saying cursing you ever heard the word damn Say it in Texas and see what happens. Because damn has just been cut down. It actually means damn you to hell. And in the old days, they'd say it to your face. Damn you to hell. That's a curse. Huh? Now you just say damn, but it's still a curse. Huh? You shouldn't say damn. It only has one meaning. Damn you to hell. Bloody. Do you understand you're violating the blood of Christ when you do that? That's, what, that's how it started out. Cussing. Listen to me, beloved. These things that the enemy sets up to bring you into bondage to your own standards that you're failing so that you will not receive the benefits of God. Watching pornography, swearing, marriage failures guilt will rob you of all your godly benefits now let me say something about marriage failures because it's a plague in our day 
because it's now socially acceptable for divorce and remarriage. Now, don't think I'm picking on you, blood, because I've been divorced and remarried. Right. What did I do with that? Oh, I made a terrible mess of that too. Right. Now listen to me. There are some Christians who God has given wonderful gifts and wants them to use it, but they feel they can't because they've been married three or four times. Now, that makes you a failure in marriage. It doesn't make you a failure with God. Because if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Now, some of the young women struggle because of their lifestyle prior to Christ. Huh? They were more generous, let's put it that way, than they should have been. Huh? And now they sit there and it ruins it goes over and over and over and over. Remember once the preacher came to our church and he said, if you do, you gotta, you got to get it right. Whatever you stole, take it back. If you don't take it back and fix it all up, you're not going to heaven. I went, oh my God. I would need three lifetimes to take everything I swiped. Let alone the other stuff we did. And here, I, I want to share with you again, not to be brag, but to understand how low things got for us. Right? We accidentally killed an old lady. How do you think that feels? Well, I couldn't sleep for a day. I'd dream of her and she'd be screaming at me. I just about lost my mind. You know, we didn't mean to, but we did. And it happened because we were doing a crime. Listen to me, beloved. Don't tell me you can't overcome. Because Davy did. I had to. Listen to me, beloved. Forget not all his benefits. I do not have to work with God to try and get brownie points to make him feel that I'm better. Uh -huh. I need that for me. I need that for the others that want to backbite me. But what God has done is imputed a gift to me called righteousness. It's right there. If you read Romans, and I suggest you do, it's right there. Now, when John was preaching this morning, he was talking about the deposit, and I was thinking, man, oh man, man, oh man, part of that deposit are the promises of God are contained within that deposit. And yet you can't count the Christians that don't know about the deposits of the benefits. Here's the main benefit. Now the main benefit as a sinner is getting saved. Some smarter than you thought. The main benefit as a Christian is understanding righteousness by faith. Right. The Bible says very clearly if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from... All. How many? All. How many? All. 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 See? Boy, if the Irish can get it, what's wrong with you Aussies? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thanks for <laughs> Okay, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. You understand this, beloved, that that he forgives all. He forgives all. And here's the normal Christian thing. Does the sin on the Monday. Goes to God on the Tuesday. Oh God, <laughs> oh God. The Bible says we confess our sins. We pray for the just to forgive us. Of course, it's all that righteous. It's the most quoted scripture in the Bible. True. And yet when you listen to him now. I did the same. I go, please forgive me. Oh God, that scripture never once says to plead with God to forgive you. It doesn't mention it. It says if we confess our sins, they're so busy pleading with God to be forgiven, they never ever actually confess what they did. And the Bible says you are to confess to Him what you did. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and... What's faithful mean? He'll forgive you every time. Do it his way. You can sit there and let the old past 
uh, uh, walking as a Christian where you fail, get thrown in your face and cause you not to be able to receive the benefits of God, or you can 1 John 1 9 it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. To what? To what? To cleanse us from all. Not some, not most, but all unrighteousness. And when that happens, a miracle happens. Now, I'm just about done. Bear with me. <clears throat> See, I tell people I'm little, but I'm loud. But I fit. I'm little, but I'm long-winded. <laughs> Faithful and just to forgive us our sins, 1 John 1, 9, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, every bit of it, every time. Yeah, but I've done this thing 101 times. Actually, you've done it 104, but it doesn't make any difference. If we confess our sins, because once you understand and say what you are to him, admit what you are, Lord, I'm this, I'm that, I'm a liar, I'm a gambler, you know, whatever it is. And I thank you that you're my forgiver. Immediately. You are actually doing righteousness by faith. You're using your faith to receive the gift of righteousness. Now, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become of who? The righteousness of who? The righteousness of St. John. The righteousness of St. David. The righteousness of Pastor Colin. Definitely not. <laughs> you got it? The righteousness of God. Now the last time I looked, God was still righteous. And he's, he, he's prepared to deem that righteousness to you. Not because you earned it, but because he loves you. And you do not have to sit and ruminate over and over and over. Now let me say again about marriage and then I'll, I'll get done. Uh, where, there's, where there's more than one marriage. Some, some people have been married once, twice, three, four, you know, five, six. And they've got this wonderful gift from God. But they struggle to use it properly. Why? Well, why would God want to bless a man who's been married five times? Guess who's knocking on the door? Yeah. Satan. Because what does it say if we confess our sins? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That kind of thing is a hindrance to you receiving from God. You understand? You are a free people. Say, I'm free. I'm free. It doesn't matter what happened. He forgave me. Yeah, but I did it 142,000 times. Liar. You did it a million times. But he'll still forgive you if you come that way. It's not freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin. And it is also an act that you are able then to receive the benefits. What are the benefits? Healing, salvation, peace. Joy. That's right. Hit it bang on there, Mama. Yeah. Praise God. You understand? Righteousness, peace, and joy. The Bible says it this way. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not offerings and, and work talking about the drink offering, talking about the meat offering. But the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness imputed for your journey from here to heaven. Well, I'm on my way to heaven. <laughs> See, I, I get happy. I can't help it. It's all right. uh, I was God's greatest failure. I used to be convinced I was as messed up. I was the most messed up Christian there was. And if and if, uh, you know, I didn't want to hang around new Christians because I knew once they hung around with me, they'd all give up and go away. Huh? And then I found out the secret. It wasn't by Dave's strength. 
It wasn't by Dave's works, but it was by the Lord's benefit to me that if I do it His way, His way works. Bless God. 